Hi again, everyone. Patrick Fingston here. I write the Illinois political newsletter, which you can find every day at theillinois.com, I-L-L-I-N-O-I-Z-E, where we put out a daily newsletter, website updates, podcasts, and videos, and all sorts of stuff on Illinois politics and government as we're uh, quickly approaching the March 19th primary. Uh, as we look at Springfield, very little happening in terms of, of actual action. Uh, if you if you want to put it that way, uh, with the uh, uh, Democrats in charge, with a lot of primaries, a lot of things they don't want their members to get on the wrong side of, uh, with voters headed to the polls in just a couple of weeks. So we're kind of in a holding pattern, but there are still a lot of issues that are out there and need to be discussed and need to be handled. And, and, and we're going to keep talking about through the uh, end of the legislative session in, in May. On the show today, we'll talk to Joe Sosnowski. He's a state representative from Rockford who's uh, been active on uh, issues like property taxes and the migrant crisis. Of course, Rockford had a, a direct uh, hit, if you if you want to put it that way, when the state of Texas sent a plane load of, of asylum-seeking migrants to Rockford uh, that then, of course, had to be uh, sent to Chicago. Uh, for for processing and and work through the system that's been set up for for those migrants, but it's an issue that's not going away uh, anytime soon. We'll also talk to Dean Olson. He's a longtime Springfield reporter. Uh, was with the State Journal Register for more than twenty years. Uh, now with the Illinois Times, the the weekly publication out of Springfield. He's been covering the criminal case of former state senator, former gubernatorial candidate, Sam McCann. Uh, I, of course, have a, a tie to McCann when I worked with Senate Republicans a decade ago. Uh, McCann was one of my uh, my charges, so uh, I always have to kind of keep an eye on on what I say there. But, of course, I have, I have no role in, in his issue and didn't have any role in his, his third-party race for governor in 2018. But... Uh, it's been a, a dramatic fall from grace for McCann uh, and, and the latest twists and turns in his uh, criminal case are wild, to say the least. So we'll talk to Dean Olson about that. You know, the the issues out there continue to, to persist. Uh, the migrant crisis continues to be one of those. Uh, House Speaker Chris Welch uh, actually gave an interview this week. Uh, for the first time in I don't know how long. He spoke to our friend Tamon Bradley from WGN in Chicago, uh, who asked him about the migrant crisis. Uh, pre- uh, Welch kind of uh, blew past the idea of uh, doing something in the meantime, whether it would be a supplemental appropriation or something in the short term, and just kind of responded in a uh, more broad uh, budgetary Situation. Well, we haven't started counting votes yet for a budget. Uh, you know, we're very early on in the process. Uh, we're going to consider all issues as we go through this process. So that, of course, courtesy of WGN. Um, Welch clearly didn't say much. It, it's so interesting to hear the difference in urgency from J.B. Pritzker and the legislative leaders. Clearly, Pritzker um, is either more interested, more threatened, uh, more uh, persistent on doing something for the migrant crisis. Uh, maybe it's because he's getting the brunt of the the pushback from the city and from uh, from Mayor Brandon Johnson. Uh, but but legislative leaders, I don't know if it's pushback from the Black Caucus or or members who are, are not particularly interested in, in spending more money on the migrant crisis when they want to spend money on other things. Uh, it's, it really does not seem to be a legislative priority, uh, at least certainly in this uh, first week of February. Let's, let's get into that a little bit more. We are pleased to bring in State Representative Joe Sosnowski. It's a seventy-eight to forty. I mean, and we can we can talk and play, placate on issues all day. I mean, but but you guys are in such a minority. You know, we're in an election year, so Democrats don't want to give any of your members, especially any in vulnerable districts, any wins. How how disconcerting is it? Disheartening is it to to be a Republican in Springfield right now? 
Yeah, it's it's tough. And, uh, you know, when I go and, and talk to, uh, you know, constituents and, and, you know, whether it be a chamber or just a little local group or somebody just calling the office, you know, they're, of course, um, surprised to hear how the legislative process works. You know, everybody still thinks about, uh, you know, you introduce a bill, you get a, a full debate, you know, it's an up or down vote and you move on from there. Uh, you know, they don't realize how, you know, especially being in the super minority, how legislation gets buried. Like you said, there's no wins um, going to be allowed for a Republican candidate, especially in, in swing districts. You know, having said that, obviously, we work through the, the operations of state government. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, we can help out with on a day to day constituent basis, just getting stuff done, finding answers to questions, you know, working them through the process. But, you yeah, know, on the political side, though, we have the reality to deal with as Republicans we have got to frame, you know, strong messages. We've got to get out and have good candidates ready to go, uh, working now, working on winning elections and, and hitting the Democrats over the head on where their failures are so that we can pick up seats this fall. We've, we've got to move in the opposite direction. We've got to start gaining some seats and it's, we're not going to have a big win this fall, but if we can chip away, uh, get a couple seats, uh, I think that would be a, a momentum starter. Well, and that's, I mean, that's part of the challenge too, is you've got seven seats that Republicans hold that Joe Biden won in 2020. And a lot of those members are having a hard time raising money. The speaker's bringing in gobs and gobs and piles of union cash. Uh, if and, and we can get into politics if you want to, but like, is there is there light at the end of the tunnel right now? Well, I, I think there there can be. Uh, again, it depends on uh, work ethic. You know, in the House, I like what what Tony is doing. You know, she's she's putting focus on uh, candidates. You know, let's pick those seats and. Uh, go to the areas that, that we can win. But, you know, a lot of it depends on those individual candidates in those areas. And, um, you know, again, you know, back to leadership, there's gotta be pressure on them to make sure they're, they're working hard and doing what they need to. Uh, but, you know, we, we hear anecdotally and, and I know firsthand, but, you know, you see other races when, when people are successful, you don't necessarily need gobs of money up front. Uh, if you're putting in the legwork, you're spending the time knocking on doors. Uh, you know, between now and Election Day, there's a lot of months. There's a lot of people um, to meet uh, as a Republican candidate who's going to be outspent 10 to 1, you know, in a race that is, you know, maybe a district that's, uh, you know, plus R1 or 2 or plus D1 or 2 or, or maybe even 3 or 4. You know, you can gain a lot of ground if you're really out there working hard, even without a lot of money to spend. And, and you know, we'll see in the fall who is working. Um, and we see this all the time, you know, and even in the uh, statewide offices, you'll see, you'll see swings in these districts, you know, maybe a traditional Republican district, but all of a sudden, you know, the treasurer did really well, the comptroller did really well or vice versa. Um, and, uh, you know, so it can be done, but yeah, we have to go going in with the reality. I mean, we're going to be outspent uh, with gobs of money and um, they're going to have a, a strong infrastructure and, and we're not going to pick up 20 seats. So if, if we can focus on a handful you know, that's where our efforts need to be. What what does the Trump factor do for Republicans this year? I mean, he's if he's yeah. likely going to be the nominee. I mean, we we I think we can all accept the 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 mathematical reality here that yep. he's likely to be the nominee. He's lost Illinois by a million votes twice. Uh, he has essentially made the Republican brand toxic in the suburbs, uh, where a lot of those really competitive races are gonna be. Uh you know, it's and, and as a downstater originally, you know, I, I, I know how popular he is south of I-80. So so how do Republicans navigate that? Because you have a guy that's that's so popular in, in portions of downstate and so unpopular uh, in the, the population centers of the state. How, how do Republicans navigate that? Well, it's a good question, and we can actually probably relate this to a lot of things. But, uh, you know, a lot of times Republicans, we shoot ourselves in the foot as a party. Um, you know, just to speak holistically with with Trump on the ballot here, I, I think we're going to see right now there's some positive trends, you know, polling right now, obviously snapshot in time. Um, I think Biden is so bad uh, that it will help our numbers uh, in Illinois here. 
And again, Trump's going to be Trump. We'll see how his campaign goes. But, you know, as Republicans, we can't avoid it and say, oh, we're just not going to talk about him. You know, he's not going to be our candidate. You know, we're going to try to focus on somebody else. I mean, I was telling people six months ago, you know, it's done. The primary is done. Uh, no, no time in the point of history of polling has a candidate who's already top 50 percent uh, that early with polls ever gone on to lose a primary. And so, you know, folks nationally and in the state that were hoping for another candidate, it just wasn't going to happen. So, number one, you know, let's accept that. Number two, let's build our Illinois brand. And number three, let's address the fact that some of his policies were a whole lot more beneficial for the country overall. And what we're seeing from Biden is terrible policy, and it's trickling down to immigration and how it's affecting the state of Illinois and Chicago, literally costing us hundreds of millions of dollars because of bad national policy. So we need to be smart about Republicans, take those big issues, make them local, not run away and say, oh, we're scared of Trump. But, you know, here's the reality of it. Biden is bad for Illinois and it's costing us hundreds of millions. And in the future, you know, it could be over a billion dollars just in the immigration issue alone. Well, you bring up immigration, you bring up the migrant crisis, which, you know, you were part of a group of Republicans uh, from the Rockford area that that at a, a news conference a couple of weeks ago, essentially basically saying we don't want the migrants here, uh, which is maybe summing it up a little too simply. But but the reality is that they're here. They're here legally. Asylum seekers are here legally. Um, I think we can have the conversation about, uh, you know, the health insurance for undocumented or illegal immigrants that are here. That's that's certainly a conversation and cost that the, the governor is seeming to have a hard time to keep in check. But the migrant crisis is here. It's at our doorstep. These are real people. A five-year-old kid died in a shelter. You know, it, 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 I came away watching your, and I think you know that I, 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 I'm fond of you and I'm, I'm fond of how you, how you legislate, but I came away of watching that news conference a few weeks ago thinking these guys look heartless uh, at, at the, the way that they're trying to treat these people who are here legally trying to get out of hell. How, how do you respond to that? Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, it's tough, um, you know, and I'm not a dispassionate person, you know, uh, care about our fellow human beings, we want to help as many people as we can. But, you know, there's a certain reality. So you've got to balance the human aspect, compassion, and, and just reality. And, you know, so number one, uh, we have terrible policy at the national level, we're letting in hundreds of thousands of people under the guise of asylum, where really, you know, if we went back to Trump era policies, we'd have much better flow. And, uh, you know, yes, we have a terrible legal uh, system right now for people just trying to seek legal uh, citizenship. I mean, I have people living in my district that have been here 10 years legally, work, come from Europe or Asia, or all types of different areas. They still can't get U.S. citizenship. They're still, they're still waiting. So national side uh, aside, you know, what we've done in Illinois here through the administration is we've essentially set up a, a migrant welfare society, though, you know, we're, we're offering the free health care as we outlined in our press conference. So we're, we're offering free health care for non-residents, no co-pays, no premiums. But the, but no the free health care plan, the free health care plan is separate from the migrants. Oh, I it mean, is, but it's not. The, 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 the health coverage or the health care that that the asylum seekers gets the federal program. It's not a state program. The state program is completely different. Yeah. Well, uh, some of those people end up transitioning over time into it though. And again, it's, you know, it, it's, it's being advertised out there and even the governor realizes it's a problem because they put a cap on it. So many people are enrolling now in that, that it's, you know, nearing a billion dollars in cost. So, you know, while there's some technical, you know, issue who pays where it goes, you know, eventually people are flooding into that system, though. So it's, it's an advertisement to say, hey, come to Illinois. Uh, on top of the hundreds of millions of dollars that Chicago is spending, uh, several hundred million dollars that the state has spent or is planning to spend in housing, clothing, providing food, shelter, you know, et cetera. And so if you create all of these opportunities and the benefits and, and welcoming, you know, the word spreads and you're going to continue to have more uh, folks come here. And again, you know, we want to be compassionate, but is it really the obligation of the state of Illinois with Illinois state taxpayer dollars to spend on non-residents when we have 
veterans without housing. We have seniors leaving the state because it's too costly. We have seniors living on fixed income who are struggling. We have poor families and, and mothers struggling to, to you know, keep their kids in school and work. And, you know, we've got a lot of our own issues right now. And to move a billion dollars or a half a million, you know, where, where, however you want to you know, splice up the, the pie of money, we're moving a lot of money towards non-resident services when we have people uh, in Illinois that need help. And it, and it shouldn't just be on Illinois or Chicago to manage that burden. Is that the crux of the issue, essentially? I mean, even if even if the state wanted to, and I mean, the Speaker and the Senate President have been very leery to, to put more funding into the issue. You know, the, the budget that was passed in May was kind of on a on a whisker of, of being balanced. We're talking about a, a deficit in the next fiscal year approaching a, a billion dollars. Is the answer simply that the state just doesn't have the money? Well, that's, that's one of them. Uh, you, you just can't, you can't, you can't spend money on everything. You just don't have enough money to do everything that you, you would like to, um, you know, and again, um, you know, back to again, Nash, I don't want to turn it into national because we don't really have control over that. But part of it would be, hey, it'd be great to see the mayor, the speaker, and the governor saying, secure the border and change our policies. You know, we don't need legislation to do that. Go back to the Trump era immigration policies where people were still coming in, uh, but we've got to stem the tide to re provide relief. So at least, you know, state that, ask for that help and be fervent about it. And then in, in Illinois sense, you know, we've got to, you know, avoid directing too many funds towards those areas. Uh, and as you mentioned, yeah, we're going to have, you know, an operational uh, budget uh, coming, uh, operational budget deficit coming up next year with a lot of pressures mounting, no federal dollars coming. Uh, and we, we've got a lot of challenges to face. And this is on top of, you know, increasing uh, the income tax years ago, which brought in, you know, billions of dollars in, in additional revenue. And we've, we've spent every dime of it. And that I think that leads to maybe the the issue that the House Republicans are trying to make their thing this spring is that of property taxes. Of course, you know people know the state doesn't directly charge property taxes, but but school and school districts make up fifty percent of our property tax bills. Uh, you all are are behind an, an idea that as pension costs continue to drop, uh, some of that money gets funneled to. Uh, to school districts with the expectation that that they cut property taxes. Uh, why why is that a good idea? Well, it's essential for, you know, several macro issues. Uh, you know, just number one, let's just talk population. You know, we, we can get into a debate if, you know, Illinois lost population or gained, you know, the Census Bureau, maybe the numbers are wrong. And, you know, the bottom line is, if we grew at the rate of most of our neighbors, you know, just about 1%, 1.5%, we would have over a million more people living in Illinois over the last decade. And so what that does for a state economy, what that does for tax revenue, what that does for the local uh, governments is massive. And it, sh it, it helps, you know, with growing the economy and showing a robust business environment, uh, which, which gets things moving. You know, just the flow of money, you know, through the, uh, uh, through the economy is massive. So we're not seeing that. Why are we not seeing that? Property taxes are high. Overall taxation is high. And, uh, you know, I represent, used to represent more of it, but, uh, you know, I was a city alderman in Rockford, represent a, a part of Rockford. So we have one of the highest property taxes in the state. We're one of the poorest median income communities, just the city of Rockford, if you take that as a whole. And, and what's happening? We've lost 5,000 residents uh, and not all of them moved out of state. Some have just said, well, we're out of here. We're moving to the next county. We're moving a couple cities over. We're, we're gonna find lower property taxes. Uh, we're gonna find a better opportunity and, and some have left the state. And so as a community, uh, just in a little microcosm, that's what's happening in some of our communities. Now, some of the suburbs in and around Chicago are kind of insulated from this. We definitely have several counties that have grown, uh, but that's not the vast majority. And as an overall state, again, you know, we're essentially flat um, and, and that's a real problem. So we have to address why people leave, why people can't stay. And, and I hear all the time and I'm it, pretty decent. You know, my, I've got three counties, McHenry, Boone and Winnebago. And, you know, we've got pretty good areas, uh, but we've got areas of challenge also but you know i hear all the time seniors who are saying hey we're on a fixed income and property taxes going up 10 percent a year in my area 
I'm not, I can't deal with it. It's getting too expensive. You know, we're going to start looking elsewhere. And it's not just seniors, young families, um, individuals, you know, uh, kids graduating from college, you know, they're not choosing Illinois as their first stop. And so we have to figure out all those macro reasons and start to address it. We just can't continue to ignore it. But the functional answer here is, is really if, if, I mean, schools get source, schools get their money from two main sources, state government mm-hmm. and property taxes. If you're taking away the property tax revenue, you're you're going to have to increase the state's share spent on education. We're again talking about the state having no money, or at least not enough money. Yeah. Um, while the 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 Ozinga idea makes sense in theory, uh, considering the the pension costs will ramp down over the next twenty years, uh, we're we're still talking about. A gigantic chunk of state money that we don't have that would have to be the the means to fix the property tax problem, right? Definitely a lot of money, um, you know, and this is only one small step. Uh, you know, we, we can get into a lot of things, but it, it's interesting to point out just with that, um, that ability with the pension ramp, you know, in some areas, uh, some years, it's, you know, where the way the ramp is going, you know, could create, you know, as much as a billion dollars, uh, that could go back into some sort of relief. And we could target that on uh, those areas with lowest median income, highest property taxes, which, you know, if you target all of a sudden, boy, that makes a really uh, significant impact in those uh, more depressed areas. You know, so number one, that's, that's you know, one small step. Uh, but number two, you know, I can, you, you know, from your years of experience here, on an Every year basis here, the Illinois, the state of Illinois uh, government is not looking to become more efficient. You know, we don't take steps every year and say, hey, how can we save 100 million here or 50 million here? You know, we, we actually just do the opposite. We find more ways to spend money. And, you know, we can get into a lot of different comparables with different states, best practices. But, you know, states like Florida that have school districts that are just one county school districts. I mean, you start to think about the amount of money that's spent just in government services uh, in having uh, 800 plus school districts versus 90 or 100 uh, with back end costs. Again, you're probably not going to save a billion dollars, but could you save a hundred million here and there? Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, that starts to add up to real money. But, you know, our focus has to be more on on right sizing government spending and best use of resources and putting money where results are rather than just, hey, let's just keep feeding the same system. But, but there hasn't been a lot of talk or a lot of interest in wanting to do that from the majority party or the governor. I think I think my home county, which has 27 or 28,000 people, now is still has five high schools you know does that functionally make a lot of sense i mean i think i think there's a lot of merit to what you're saying uh before we let you go um you know there's a lot of silly season out there you know the the justin slaughter bill that essentially would have banned police from from making traffic stops or or uh you know, huge tax credits or the estate tax, which I feel like is a democratic ploy for politics. Um, what should people be watching in your eyes as, uh, I mean, we're a month away from the primary, but then things are really going to heat up. What are you keeping an eye on? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Um, again, I think, you know, looking at it from the big picture, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of controversial stuff that just won't be addressed. Uh, you know, going into an election year, even though there's uh, they have a super majority, you know, I don't think a lot of their members are going to want to take a, a lot of big votes on a lot of crazy stuff. And so I think they'll push a lot of that um, off till after the election. We certainly have some big issues. Um, you know, the, the biometric, uh, you know, ruling with the, the state court, you um, uh, just recently and, and how that trickles out, uh, you know, and all these lawsuits that are happening, uh, you know, maybe something that moves to to kind of slow these down. On the other hand, the court gave some relief in the sense that it allowed, um, you know, uh, local courts to modify the uh, the awards. I'm not an expert in that area, but, but obviously we can't have multi-billion dollar lawsuits that close up businesses, you know, just based off some issues with fingerprint storage and stuff like that. Not saying that it's not important, uh, but I think that's an issue that's out there. Uh, the main thing, you know, in, in my role as a revenue uh, spokesperson, we'll be looking at the budget. I, I think that's really the, the big the big thing is getting a, a budget uh, patched up together and just seeing where where monies go and, and where dollars 
dollars are, are are set, you know, and where uh, the money is directed towards things like the immigrant uh, costs and things like that, uh, and how that balances out. We're going we're to have some budget pressures here, and it's going to be a, an interesting spring just getting a balanced budget proposed, but we'll see how that pans out. Representative Joseph Snowski, Republican from Rockford. Uh, Representative, appreciate the time as always, and uh, we'll see you in Springfield soon. Thanks so much. You have a great day. Thanks to Representative Joseph Snowski for his time. Let's uh, turn now to the weird, wild uh, criminal case surrounding former state Senator Sam McCann, uh, who faces uh, uh, corruption charges for misuse of campaign funds. And and this uh, this trial has taken a lot of weird turns. So we bring in Dean Olson from the Illinois Times. He's been following this insane uh, corruption case of former state Senator Sam McCann, who's uh, from Macoupin County, just south of Springfield. Full disclosure, when I was on Senate Republican staff a million years ago, uh, I worked closely with McCann uh, and and probably have some insights that that we we don't want to share now. But uh, Dean, I, I appreciate you uh, you taking a few minutes. Um, kind of catch us up to speed. What got Sam McCann in hot water? Well, Sam McCann ran. He was in the. He represented the Springfield area for about ten years ago and uh, served several terms as a state senator. He started by defeating uh, Senator Deanna, Deanna DiMuzio, who is the w- widow of Vince DiMuzio, the longtime serving uh, state senator from Carlinville. And those were Democrats, and he's a Republican. So uh, he was kind of a firebrand in that he uh, was a labor-friendly Republican, and there aren't too many of them nowadays and he operated a construction business he really connected with people he got support from the tea party as well as labor unions and so he he uh later ran against governor rauner uh in the republican primary was defeat was defeated didn't win against rauner in 2018 uh, he ended up getting about four percent of he, the vote. He actually he didn't run in the primary. He ran as a third party candidate in the general. You're you're right. You're right. He created his his own conservative party, and then he uh, and then they they ran against Rauner uh, and and Pritzker. So uh, he thought that Rauner was not conservative enough, and uh, As you probably know, uh, Sam McCann was kind of ostracized from the Republicans, even though he was serving as a Republican in the legislature at that time. Um, He complained that the Republicans weren't even providing him staff support and complained a lot about that. So he was kind of persona non grata with a lot of the Republicans in the legislature. Um, And then he ran against uh, Rauner and Pritzker and what happened was he eventually got indicted three years ago uh, for allegedly misusing campaign funds from both the the gubernatorial contributions and from prior contributions that he received. Uh, Actually, a lot of the contributions were from labor organizations. So the case has dragged on in part because of the pandemic, because the pandemic slowed down the processing of court cases in the federal court system. He was indicted for uh, misusing about $200,000 or more in campaign funds and using them in an elaborate scheme, uh, allegedly, to uh, pay for personal expenses, mortgages, trailers, RVs, cars, Uh, going on personal vacations. Um, Sam McCann is not a rich person, um, and he has a wife and some children. His his wife is a registered nurse. Uh, So he he was indicted, and now he is claiming that he was not represented fairly by his attorneys. In November, he fired all his court-appointed attorneys. He said he couldn't afford to hire one on his own and uh, went on his own to represent himself. So that created a lot of problems because he expected that all of the 
court calendars and the and the time limits be turned back so he could basically analyze this entire case and that's not how the law works so uh he had a he had a trial that was supposed to start a bench trial in federal court in springfield uh in november so the judge gave him additional time after he said he wanted to represent himself to to come to trial he kept asking for delays got some delays but uh, the prosecution has basically said he's tried to manipulate the process. And, uh, and so now he is in the hospital. He was in the hospital. He was supposed to start his trial on Monday and was uh, hospitalized over the weekend, apparently with not, without notifying the probation office, which is a big no-no. And you could be actually jailed for that. Uh, but his wife drove him to a hospital in St. Louis, and uh, we don't know exactly what's wrong with him. It, it, he's gotten a stress test, apparently, so I don't know if it's heart problems, back problems, other problems. He said that he's been treated for kidney stones before. They haven't really gone into those details, but the court personnel, the judge, the prosecution, his, his standby attorney have all gotten medical records. And so the trial was supposed to restart um, later this week, but then yesterday he was still in, in the hospital and now the judge has postponed it until Monday. So we'll see what happens uh, at that time. Tim Bass, the assistant U.S. attorney says this is a manufactured crisis, implying that basically uh, McCann panicked about all of this and came up with some reason to get uh, admitted to the hospital, and now we're we're set for Monday. So we'll see what happens next. Uh, Bass, the prosecutor, has indicated he may try to get uh, McCann's personal recognizance bond, which allows him to be free at this time. They can try to revoke that and put his put him in jail, and basically bring him to court to make sure that he can't have a flat tire or can't have another health emergency where they're depending on his description of what's wrong with him. So uh, the prosecution says he's trying to manipulate the process. Um, all Sam has really said as in his defense is that this is a politically motivated prosecution. He hasn't really presented in court documents or verbally uh, any sort of explanation for these expenses and these allegations of tax fraud, wire fraud, and uh, misuse of campaign funds. So we'll, we'll have to see. He has refused to plead guilty. Um, he's basically said he doesn't worry about uh, whether he might go to prison for up to 20 years. He said, this is all in God's hands and uh, these people can't steal my soul. And he's made religious type statements like that. He said he's not nervous at all. Um, when he was on video from the hospital, he was in, a, in his bed, uh, apparently with a hospital gown on, and he was his head was back and his eyes were closed. Looks like he was in pain. He opened his eyes right after the court hearing. I don't know what's going on. It's just uh, kind of an unusual situation, even by political standards. So, so let's go backward here to, to November, because this is when things really took a weird turn. Also worth mentioning, unlike a lot of members of the General Assembly, McCann's not an attorney, um, so he can't, you know, he, he's not qualified to represent himself, didn't go to college, um, you know, so, so, and, and we all know the, uh, the old line that a, a man who represented himself has a fool for a client, but, but why did, what was his reason? What was his explanation to the court? when he said, I don't want this, this public defender appointed for me? Well, he's had a string of public defenders, basically. And he he's basically said that he doesn't want this guy to represent him because this attorney uh, has uh, wanted, put pressure on him to do a plea deal and previously did not get, disclose all the evidence against him. The attorney... Uh, uh, disputed all that and um and basically uh sam said he wasn't satisfied with his defense he's kind of said that before to about other attorneys 
Um, but he said this was the first time that he said this in open court, that he felt like his attorneys were pushing him toward a plea deal. And that one of them, and the most recent one, said, you're going to prison anyway in confidence. That that attorney disputed that and said he did not tell that to Sam. So it was pretty bizarre uh, for somebody to try to go to court representing themselves against very professional, smart uh, prosecutors that have basically unlimited funds to prosecute you. They had several people lined up for, uh, to, to testify both in November from, the, from various agencies uh, to back up the claims of tax fraud and Ill illegal use of money. Um, and each time they had to be sent home. So it was, uh, it, I'm, I, I, I've never seen it happen like that before. I mean, I've seen criminal defendants represent themselves. They always lose. It's often in murder cases where people are, you know, have had very difficult lives and lots of crime involved. But Sam has a clean record and he could very well go to prison for many years because of this. Now, uh, to be fair, and and I don't, I mean, I, this is just anecdotally from a decade ago. You know, I, I know that there is a history of, of back issues there. So maybe this is a legitimate uh, health claim, but it really sounds like, and, and you know, your reporting, Hannah Meisel's reporting has, has been great uh, on this story. The quotes and comments from not only the assistant U.S. attorney, but the judge, um, he has not made a lot of friends in this process, has he? Right. He basically said uh, out after the November hearing, he did speak with Hannah and myself outside the courtroom, outside the courthouse and said he does not want to save much that that because he doesn't want to make the judge upset with him. Well, he's decided the judge is going to hear this case and the judge will be the one to sentence him. But it's clear from the tone of the judge's voice and just the, the conversation that she he's not making any friends with this judge. So she's she's weighing all of this. I'm sure she's thinking about, well, if I force him to go to trial, what does that do to a potential appeal? Uh, if he files one. So she's being very careful uh, to provide him with a lot of rope, but he's using every bit of that rope. And we'll see what happens next because there probably has to be a limit to how many times he can independently get himself hospitalized or have medical emergencies before the court will want to have more direct supervision over him. So I'm, I'm thinking that the next issue might be whether to revoke his, his bond. There's no cash bond in the, in the federal system. You're either in jail or you're not in jail. Uh, and so he's, he's already violated. She told him that he violated uh, terms of his probation because he went outside of the central district of Illinois without notifying the probation office Sam always has a response for everything. He basically said, my understanding was that I could go anywhere in Illinois and in St. Louis County where I have medical uh, care without telling the probation office. And she said, no, remember when you signed this probation document and that's what it said. And then he apologizes. So he keeps apologizing. And then he, then he's, he's very polite with, with the judge. He's disagreed with the prosecutors, basically saying he did not manufacture this crisis. Um, and so, so there's just a, a, a long history of, and there have been a couple judges over this case. Uh, judge Lawless is the latest judge, and but it appears that she and the prosecutor are losing patience with Sam McCann, and we'll see what happens next. It's a sad downfall for a, a, a once well-respected legislator. So, Dean, thanks so much for the time. We really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Take care. Hey there, Patrick here. Friday morning uh, after we had recorded this with Dean Olson, uh, the federal judge in Springfield ordered that Sam McCann be taken into federal custody. 
uh, after he failed to report to the probation department uh, after he had been released from the hospital. So in another crazy twist in this story, Sam McCann now in federal custody awaiting his trial likely to begin on Monday. So we're adding that after the fact, of course. All right. Thanks to Dean Olson from the Illinois Times for his time uh, on the show today. And also thanks to Representative Joe Sosnowski for his time uh, to talk about issues facing uh, Springfield and uh, facing Republicans at large in the state. Uh, always appreciate him. He, he allows me to to push back on him a little bit without uh, without trying to make it personal, without trying to get uh, angry or grumpy. And that's what I appreciate when that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to have honest, real conversations around here. So that's that's what we're going to keep trying to do. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks so much for for taking time out of your day uh, to join us. We know you've got a lot of things in the air and a lot of uh, places you could be listening to uh, content and, and, and news. And we're happy you're, you're reading our newsletter. We're happy you're listening or watching our podcast. So thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again next time here on the Illinois podcast.